Hello, everyone. Welcome to Building on Europe's Edge in the Green Transition at the World Economic Forum Davos Agenda 2021. My name is Sarah Kelly, and I'm really thrilled to be your moderator. Around the world, countries, regions, and industries are adapting their strategic priorities in order to lead in the green transition of the global economy. The European Green Deal aims to slash greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050 and has given the EU a policy lead. Meantime, China has announced that it will target net zero by 2060. The U.S. is back in the Paris Climate Accord and has promised to inject $2 trillion into clean energy over the next four years. So how can the EU maintain the first mover advantage? To discuss, we have a very distinguished panel. Valdis Dombrovskis is Executive Vice President for an Economy that Works for People at the European Commission. Christian Zeving is CEO of Deutsche Bank and a member of the International Business Council. Odile Renaud Basso is president of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the EBRD. And Thomas Bubel is CEO of AXA and a young global leader at the World Economic Forum. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us for this session. Just a, a couple of quick notes before we get started. Um, those who are joining via top link, please do feel free to submit your questions for our panelists via the chat function. Also, um, a bit of a structural note, this is a two-part session. It begins with a live streamed panel, which will then be followed by a private interactive discussion limited to the official participants of the Davos Agenda Week. So without any further ado, um, I'd like to hand it to Thomas Bubel to kick us off with some opening remarks to set the stage for us because this session is associated with the World Economic Forum's CEO Action Group for the European Green Deal. You're co-chair of that group, which is all about private sector helping to achieve the goals of the Green Deal through collaboration. Tell us a little bit more about your efforts and where the initiative stands right now. Thank you, Sally, and uh, good evening to all of you. I'm uh, very delighted uh, also on behalf of my co-chair, Feike, who should also be with us, um, that we are all gathered uh, here today for one of uh, Europe's most pressing but also greatest opportunity. Um, I would also like to thank uh, Commissioner Dombrovskis because the European Commission has really from the first uh, hour of this um, initiative uh, supported and helped a lot. And certainly thank you very much for, uh, as well to Irono Basso who is uh, with us today and in particular the entire WEF team who has been working really hard on uh, making this initiative very, very concrete, with very concrete commitments. Climate change uh, is certainly one of the major uh, challenges that we are facing um, already, but also going forward uh, in Europe, across the whole world, through global warming. We've certainly seen it, uh, that weather has become less predictable, uh, more violent, but also that um, uh, populations um, have become far more vulnerable. Uh, certainly, the pandemic is, uh, shown us, uh, has shown us at the moment how difficult it is uh, in terms of um, making sure that we uh, remain uh, coherent within our societies. The crisis and the um, development towards a more sustainable um, uh, energy and climate uh, uh, arena is also a question where we can uh, see it as a historic opportunity because um, building back better means certainly that we can reorient the massive investments that we need to do to a more sustainable economy. We can certainly uh, innovate much more when it comes to cleaner technologies and we can also leverage the advantage and the power of the European Union. And uh, uh, Sarah, you mentioned it, um, the fact that uh, the US rejoined uh, the Paris Agreement is particularly something uh, that I appreciate a lot. When you look at Europe, um, we can see that Europe has done a lot so far, and that um, others are trying to catch up now, and it's also the role of Europe uh, to help um, when it comes to how do we define a global order of climate transition. One, you need global standards. Uh, the EU has uh, uh, gone very far already, has thought this uh, through when it comes to the question around uh, extra financial standards. And uh, it is important uh, that Europe uh, does promote um, its models, but also its values. The second question is about uh, data and matrix. Um, 
how do you measure impact, uh, how do you measure progress? And we've seen today a vast majority of KPIs, and it's important that we come to uh, one or several clear and understandable uh, uh, metrics points. And then there is certainly also a question of um, the, I would say, non-binary and dynamic taxonomy. We've understood very well um, uh, what is bad and what is good, but the space around transition. So how do we go, for example, from oil to gas? What is uh, the classification of nuclear? Those are things that uh, are very important uh, to be defined now. In this uh, CEO action group, um, we have very much focused on the private sector commitments. And this has always been viewed as a, how can the private sector help together with the public authorities to make this a, a good deal and a collaborative deal. And, um, you've seen the Lighthouse projects that have been developed by uh, the individual members of the action group. And um, I'm very proud to see that there is a lot of commitment, that there is uh, a lot of engagement. And beyond the collective engagement, you also see that each company individually has shown some very strong commitments to be quicker and to be more concrete. When it comes to the uh, financial service sector, um, uh, to which uh, AXA certainly belongs to, uh, there is a very strong community around these commitments uh, to go to net zero, through the net uh, zero asset owner alliance that is already existing, through the net zero asset management alliance that is now uh, coming up to speed, but also through the net zero underwriting alliance, um, uh, when you look at it from an insurance perspective, um, that uh, will be created soon. And we are very proud as AXA to, uh, to share that and to also make sure that um, we find the necessary uh, progress on that side. The companies are engaged and you can clearly count on the European companies to fully support and engage themselves in this transition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, we mentioned that you're the co-chair of the CEO Action Group. Um, a little bit later, we're going to be having your co-chair, Fika Sibisma, who is honorary chairman at Royal DSM, um, joining us to summarize what we've been discussing this past half an hour and also to guide the, the next part of our conversation. So we look forward to hearing from you, Fika, in a little bit. Um, but I'd like to just go now to the executive Vice President Vladis uh, Dombrovsky is to, to react to what we have just heard from Thomas Bubel, um, what the private sector is, is looking for um, and offering uh, to the public sector. And um, uh, Executive Vice President, you oversee, of course, finance and trade portfolios at the European Commission. We know that the recovery package has more than 30% of funds allocated for green investments. Perhaps you can just begin by giving us an overview of the priorities for 2021, the recovery package, and the financing of the green transition. Uh, yeah, uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for uh, invitation to this uh, discussion. So uh, as regards uh, priorities for uh, 2021, I would say uh, priorities are uh, quite uh, clear. We're still in the middle of the pandemics, so we need to deal with immediate health crisis to save the uh, lives, to save the incomes of the people. So we need to deal with the health emergency and socioeconomic uh, consequences of uh, this. And that's why we have put in uh, place uh, in the EU number of immediate crisis response measures, uh, which uh, are uh, in, in the place and already, uh, so to say, uh, delivering. And we uh, see some positive results um, as regards the economy, for example, through the measures we put in place to protect employment, we see that there is uh, actually uh, substantial less increase in unemployment than we initially expected, given the depths of economic crisis which we are facing. Uh, looking uh, forward now, we have created ambitious recovery package. So if you look at the next um, uh, multi-annual framework, so the next multi-annual EU budget, and EU economic recovery plan, next generation EU. Uh, it's a financial package of 1.82 trillion euros. 
So it's indeed very substantial package. Uh, and the idea is what we want to achieve with this. It's not only to get the economy going, but so to say, to build back better to use this financing to facilitate the green and digital transitions of the economy and also to ensure that the economic recovery is inclusive and socially fair. Uh, you already mentioned our uh, mainstreaming uh, target. So across of this recovery funding, 30% uh, are there dedicated to the climate change. We recently increased uh, not uh, uh, also our medium term ambition. So uh, you mentioned the uh, 2050 target when we should go to the cl uh, climate uh, neutrality, but uh, we also increased ambitions for 2030. So instead of 40% uh, reduction of emissions, we are now going for 55% reduction of emissions, and this will require very substantial funding. So our estimates is that it will require uh, uh, somewhere like 350 billion euros per year additional funding over the next uh, decade. So uh, our re uh, economic uh, recovery package, of course, will be important so source of funding, as will be our Invest EU program. And uh, talking about our Invest EU program, where we, so to say, merge public and private finance, we are extending it now not only to the European uh, Investment Bank, but also to other implementing uh, uh, partners, including, for example, European Bank of Reconstruction and uh, Development. But it's uh, clear that the scale of this investment will have to be provided by the private sector. That's where our sustainable finance action plan comes in. So later this year, we'll be coming with an updated action plan uh, with a, a taxonomy on uh, or classification system of green economic activities. And uh, it was all already uh, mentioned that indeed the taxonomy will need to be uh, uh, prepared in a way that we can also uh, adjust it as our uh, thinking evolves about green economic ac activities and also as we transition towards uh, carbon neutrality, but it will also uh, include the uh, amendments to non-financial reporting directive to make sure that investors have all the necessary information, European green bond standards. So it's uh, clear that with a sustainable uh, finance package, uh, we will uh, have to uh, steer substantial private investment towards uh, uh, dealing with the climate change. And final word, uh, EU is comprising only 9% of global carbon emissions. So uh, it's of course that EU acts and that EU leads, but we need to make sure that the rest of the world moves with us. And that's where our international platform of sustainable finance comes in. So we managed to uh, scale, uh, during the last year, we managed to scale it up quite uh, substantially. Uh, we moved from uh, eight members to 15, covering some 55% of global emissions. And now with a new US administration in place, we see that uh, uh, mood is changing also in uh, US. Uh, Biden, uh, Biden administration has taken decision for US to rejoin the Paris Agreement. And we are also uh, looking forward for US potentially joining our international platform on sustainable finance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Executive Vice President. Um, so as we've heard there, uh, hundreds of billions of euros per year in additional investments are needed. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn to you, uh, Christian Zaving from Deutsche Bank to give us the private sector perspective on how to fill that gap. Um, and perhaps you'd also like to comment on, you know, the taxonomy regulation um, and, and the issue of standards and, and what Deutsche might like to see from the commission in order to help you do so. Um, from a private sector perspective though, just generally speaking, talk us through um, the financial tools, the policies that you see are necessary to drive the green recovery um, and your role in the private sector to help bridge some of those financing gaps. Well, thanks a lot, Sarah. Um, I'm delighted to be uh, on, on this panel uh, today. Um, as you are just saying, the, the uh, 
sums involved and the numbers involved are um, are huge. Um, and in particular, who looks at the capital markets in in Europe knows uh, that uh, the financing of that and the investment of that is uh, um, very closely dependent on the financial institutions because. Uh, if we just think about uh, how the normal investments uh, in traditional industries, but also now in new technologies are done, then the majority is done through financial institutions with, uh, with vastly over 60-70%. And therefore, a lot depends actually on the preparedness uh, of the balance sheet of, of financial institutions. And thus, the whole uh, transition into green technology is for us um, banks as of vital importance. Um, I do think um, that uh, in this regard, um, we can make a difference uh, and we should make a difference. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's actually an opportunity for Europe um, because here we have uh, a competitive advantage from a technology point of view. And hence um, the financial institutions are, are actually looking at this as an opportunity to be the partner of transition, uh, transitioning the uh, economy uh, into green. What does it mean? Um, clearly, from a balance sheet point of view, um, banks are stepping up. And uh, if you just look at Deutsche Bank, we have a credit portfolio of 450 billion euros. Um, of course, over time, we will see more and more um, of our credit portfolio also being used uh, in order to support the uh, um, transition into green economy. Um, we have set ourselves at Deutsche Bank a target within the next five years of financing and investments of 200 billion assets. Um, we started in, in the year 2020 um, with the first year of more than 20 billion, and that goes up to 200 billion uh, in the year 2025. And again, it's, it's, uh, that is on the one hand the financing. If you look at the capital market issuances, you see a doubling, uh, actually a tripling of issuances of, of green bonds. And again, if you then see Europe versus the rest of the world, where actually the capital markets are much deeper in the US, but when it comes to issuances of green bonds, actually Europe has a far bigger market share. And also here, the financial institutions are, are very active. So at the end of the day, um, I do believe that in particular, the role of the financial institutions in transitioning the economy into green is crucial. I do believe that financial institutions who are not actually offering that expertise, that advisory role, but also the balance sheet in order to support will be over time almost out of business. There are a lot of consultancy studies that um, actually the sustainability assets and the sustainability revenues um, from this whole program will almost replace half up to two thirds of the traditional uh, banking activities. And there you can see how important it is that we as financial institutions and banks step up. Uh, in this regard, it is on the one hand, um, a big opportunity to do the financing. Um, secondly, and that got always uh, uh, forgotten, it is also on the investment side for our private clients, um, a kind of a, a matter of huge interest. Um, you can't even believe how our demand we get from our private clients in actually reallocating their portfolios, in particular the new generation who is inheriting the portfolios from their parents are actually looking in reallocating the assets from traditional industries into more green technology. Also that actually means that the demand after green assets on the investment side is huge. And here again, the role of banks is clearly there because on the one hand, we can generate with our clients the assets. And on the other hand, we have even in-house with our private clients, um, the people who demand this, this products. And hence, I think financial institutions, banks um, are kind of in the middle of this transition. And um, again, I do think it is an opportunity for us um, but it's clearly something which must be integral and a key part of our day-to-day -day operations. I'm always telling to my people, uh, to the relationship managers, uh, to the private client advisors, um, as we have uh, advised our, um, our clients on uh, currency, on uh, rates, um, the advisory on actually um, ESG investments, the advisory on ESG financing aspects is becoming as important as any other product. And therefore, it is an opportunity, but at the same time, also a challenge for us, and we clearly have to step up.
Thank you so much um, for that perspective from Deutsche Bank. And I think probably Thomas Bluebell will have more to say on that as well um, when we get to you, Thomas. But first, I'd like to go to um, uh, President Renaud Basso to get um, the perspective as a public financial institution on, on, how, on how you're dealing with all of this, because you're, of course, operating primarily in Central Europe, Central Asia, in regions that are said to have been hit harder by the pandemic than, for example, advanced European economies. So in that context and through that lens, how has the EBRD and the regions where you operate experienced the crisis? And what does it mean for the green transition? So thank you very much, uh, first of all, for the invitation to participate to that very interesting panel. And indeed, in a way, the EBRD being a multilateral institution, but focusing on the private sector and with a very strong green agenda since a number of years, uh, is uh, dealing with a lot of issues which have been already mentioned uh, there in this panel and uh, indeed at the core of our priorities. We have set up uh, our own priority to be a green, uh, to fight, to have 50% of our investment and financing in green uh, financing in 2020. Five. And we were starting from a comfortable position in 20, uh, 20, 2019 because we were around 47% of our financing in green. And what is very striking is the impact of the crisis. We reshuffled and we reorganized our activity in order to be able to support liquidity needs, working capital needs uh, in our countries of operation, to provide emergency support for vital infrastructure projects, to provide uh, advisory support for SMEs in the countries of operation. And basically our green investment ratio has dropped quite significantly to some slightly below 30%. So it shows that in, in the short term, very short term, there is a short sort of trade-off between emergency support to support companies being available to uh, sustain uh, their activity or to compensate for the lack of activity in the context of restrictive measures, lockdown uh, everywhere, and the need to continue to focus on this long-term agenda, which is um, building back better and financing the green transition. We believe that in the context of, I mean, when getting out of the crisis, these green priorities will be extremely strong because with the pandemic, I think everybody realized that, that economies are, fra are fragile and that pandemic risk was identified as a big risk, but we also need, know that climate risk is a big big risk and a big priority in the future. So I think that the attention will focus very much in the building back better on this priority. We are dealing with countries of operation which have um, a huge challenge in this respect. We, in Eastern Europe, you know, they came, they started in the 90s with a huge dependence on coal, very highly polluted econom uh, uh, polluting economies. They already made a huge effort and the, the emission has dropped for per, uh, per unit of production by 50% in the, uh, in the last years. But they are still above, uh, for the BRD country of, of operation, we are still 30% above the average emerging countries at the same level of GDP per capita. So we still have a big challenge to, um, to move towards um, Paris Agreement objective and so forth. And to do so, I think that what a bank like EBRD can do is basically threefold. First of all, provide financing. And we, uh, as I was saying, devote a large part of our financing to green projects, a bit on uh, uh, renewable uh, uh, retrofitting of building, green cities, transportation, improvement of transportation and so forth. But we can also provide a lot of advise to the countries and support them in defining their strategy, how to reach a Paris alignment objective, how to reach zero emission in 2050. What is the right, the right pathway start coming from, a, for example, situation with a strong dependence on coal? What is the right pathway? What share of renewable and so forth? And we are providing a lot of support into this, to the countries in which we intervene to define these strategies and trying to bring them to level of ambitions that are really consistent with international commitment. And the last dimension is our own uh, 
I mean, own activity as uh, bond issuers, and we focus when in the last 10 years, we've very much focused on green bonds, and we see, as this was mentioned, a lot of uh, appetite for this kind of uh, financing. So I think that getting out of the crisis, this will be, I mean, we will have this challenge to uh, to refocus on the green economy, but we, it's very important, for example, to acknowledge what is the strategy of the EU, which is to focus the measures devoted to kickstart the economy again, so the recovery support, and to tilt it to green, I think, because you can have I mean, double effect, double dividend. The first one is uh, to support the recovery because you invest in, for example, retrofitting of building and so forth. And on the other side, you have long-term effect of benefit that are benefiting for the climate. Thank you so much um, for telling us a little bit more about that work. Um, and I'd like to expand a little bit about it because you were talking about, you know, the EU's plans, just generally speaking. Um, and I'd like to turn back to uh, Mr. Executive Vice President um, Dombrovskis to ask you about our central question today, which is really um, how does Europe, uh, what does it need to do in order to maintain the first mover edge? We've, we've heard from Thomas Bubel, for example, you know, the need to really get things defined, um, especially when it comes to finance. Um, we also know that you oversee the trade portfolio, of course, as well. Um, with regard to trade, how can you avoid that Europe is at a disadvantage because of the Green Deal regulation and that European products and services also remain competitive. Uh, well, uh, yes, uh, uh, indeed, uh, those uh, are uh, very important uh, questions. Well, uh, first of all, uh, uh, indeed, it's important that now we are actually uh, delivering on the aims of the European uh, Green uh, Deal. So we had set uh, targets, we are uh, changing uh, sectoral uh, legislation, uh, we have agreed uh, ambitious uh, financial uh, package. Now it's important that uh, this uh, financing, for example, reaches the uh, real uh, economy, reaches uh, recipients, and we uh, see uh, start seeing how this financing is actually changing situation on ground, uh, because there are many uh, initiatives which we want uh, to pursue uh, to uh, green the European economy, uh, renovation way to improve the energy efficiency of the buildings, uh, moving to the electromobility, uh, renewables, uh, looking at different uh, uh, sectoral uh, uh, legislation, uh, sectoral developments. So we uh, just need to practically move uh, forward. We need to continue to advance with our sustainable or green finance agenda. That's why I'm saying that we are coming with an updated uh, action plan, why we are putting the actual taxonomies or classification systems in place, why we are changing or adjusting our non-financial uh, reporting standards, advancing with green bond standards. So uh, all this work needs to uh, continue. Uh, and indeed, uh, the uh, question is uh, also, of course, about international uh, competitiveness and our trade agenda. Well, first of all, uh, in the World Trade Organization, we are coming with what we call a trade and climate initiative and working on this with like-minded uh, countries uh, because uh, we want to ensure that indeed there is a, a open and free trade as regards environmental goods so that we uh, allow actually the uh, environmental technologies to uh, uh, spread and to be scaled up uh, internationally. Uh, we, uh, uh, one important problem we need to address from this context is carbon leakage. And as regards uh, carbon leakage, well, uh, currently uh, we are addressing it through uh, giving uh, energy intensive industries uh, or emission intensive industries uh, free emission allowances. But it's uh, clear if we want to move towards uh, uh, carbon neutrality, we cannot continue with the system of free allowances. Uh, that's why we are currently preparing what we call carbon border adjustment mechanism uh, to address this uh, uh, system of uh, or problem of carbon le leakage by uh, different uh, means, uh, ensuring that goods that are coming uh, into the EU uh, from uh, third countries with uh, lower environmental and emission uh, standards, uh, that this uh, uh, carbon border adjustment is done to compensate for uh, 
so to say, less uh, stringent environmental standards uh, uh, elsewhere. Uh, of course, very important element of for this will be the WTO compatibility in this uh, measure. Uh, and for this, uh, the key word is so to say, non-discrimination, uh, uh, ensuring that we are not treating uh, third country producers worse or putting more stringent requirements than on our own producers. And that's something which we are uh, determined uh, uh, to ensure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now I'd like to ask all of our participants, actually, um, because we, we are a little bit short on time, um, 30 seconds each, I'd just like you to give you the opportunity to react um, to what we've just heard from the executive vice president. And also I mentioned that we're entering the more informal part um, in just a couple of minutes, perhaps some of your, your hopes going into the next part of the session, given the fact that one of the goals of the session was, was to bring together public and private. Um, perhaps you've seen some opportunities from what it is that we have been discussing. Um, and we can begin with Christian Saving. 30 seconds, please. Well, that's a challenge. Uh, um, I can uh, only encourage actually uh, the EU to uh, uh, further invest um, and actually uh, emphasize this topic. Again, I, I tried to say before, um, this is an opportunity for Europe. Um, we have a technology and we have an environment here where we are actually leading and we should play on this. Um, I think this is a chance for Europe going forward and hence I think the EU should be on top of that. President Renaud Basso. What are your thoughts? No, I think um, this issue, the issue of carbon leakage is very important. There is one issue which is also very important for the private sector and we, nobody has mentioned up to now. I think it's the economic incentive. And I think all the issues related to carbon price, I mean, the functioning of ETS mechanism in order to give pricing signal and to ensure that all the incentives are tilted to the same objective, it's very important. We know this is difficult politically because it, it has some social impact, impact on the, on the revenues of people and so forth. So it needs to be accompanied by uh, proper measures. But I think it's very, over time, it will be very important and essential if we want all companies in all areas to really have the right incentives. Thomas Bubel, your reaction, 30 seconds. We should move to action now. Uh, all many of the uh, cornerstones, be it reporting, uh, be it uh, in some part metrics, uh, be it uh, the clear ideas what to do are defined. It's really now we need to get to action and deliver. And now, as promised, we head over to Faika Sivisma, who is also um, co-chair of the CEO Action Group at the World Economic Forum, honorary chairman at Royal DSM. Uh, Faika, you've been listening to our conversation now over the past half an hour, and I'd just like to get your impressions in terms of what you are hearing, um, and also your hopes going into the next section, um, section of our session, excuse me, um, where there will be the opportunity um, for perhaps further connection, further action um, among the stakeholders that, that are present. Yeah, thank you, Sarah, for uh, uh, leading this. And of course, Mr. Dombovskis and uh, Suing and Renaud Basso for the panel. And of course, my uh, co-chair, Thomas Buber, uh, really appreciate. But I appreciate also all the participants and you get a chance to discuss and raise your questions in the next half hour, like Sarah is saying. I see Jean-Pierre Clamadieu, Christian Beck, Anfri Pini, Naoka, Jonas, Francesco. So please, join uh, the next session also and uh, live. Um, it's really important. Remember uh, how this all started, uh, supporting Frans Timmermans, colleague of Valdis Dombrovskis, who put the European Green Deal there at the commission, my fellow country, countryman. And from the World Economic Forum, especially the private sector CEOs, we want to support the activities of Frans Timmermans and make Europe really green. Not because, like the commissioner said, that Europe is the biggest emitter, it is not, uh, but Europe can lead the example. To make Europe green, indeed, like you heard, but also, uh, therefore the commissioner is here, also to provide jobs, economic growth, be on the forefront of technology development, that if the whole world later on greens, that we as Europe can also benefit from that from our economy and therefore uh, not by coincidence that Valdis Dombrovskis uh, uh, was here and made his point that this is not only greening 
but also providing technology, innovations, economic growth and, and, and jobs. Uh, as also uh, Christian and Odile said, I mean, working on the financial side of all of this. Different sectors. So we have initiatives in the farm and the whole farming sector from farm to fork, so to say, uh, projects in the retail, projects in infrastructure, in cities, etc., where private sector, I think, can contribute uh, a lot uh, in all those different sectors. And that is what we are working out and trying to support from the WEF, from the private sector, in those initiatives supported by finance, uh, the different perspectives that Europe becomes green, that Europe has the technologies, that Europe can benefit economically and job-wise from that as well. And that is what we tried to discuss in this first half hour. In, in the next session and also afterwards, I just invite uh, you to provide input, to provide ideas, to join the group and contact Thomas or contact myself uh, because we need the private sector to make this ambition of Europe come through. And as we saw in the beginning of this week, I was chairing uh, the climate adaptation session with John Kerry. Um, the US also back again uh, in the picture, wanted to contribute. Uh, I found that great, great news. So I hope if we get a competition whether Europe uh, is being uh, um, challenged by the US on the speed on greening, that will be a great competition. Thank you, Sarah, for leading this session. And of course, the panelists and a good friend and fellow co-chair, Thomas. Thank you so much, Vika. Um, really appreciate that, bringing it all into the big picture for us.